just a couple of things before I begin to look at the figure that is known as Thomas Cramner. Uh, just a little bit about books. Uh, I noticed in a number of the uh, uh, book offerings downstairs that there are a number of uh, uh, biographies of either Lady Jane Grey, who I'll speak about this afternoon, uh, Faith Cook uh, published a biography of her. It's probably the best biography available on uh, Jane Grey. J uh, Faith Cook is a, just an excellent writer. And uh, while uh, not a professional historian, certainly excels as a historian um, and is what we would, might describe as an independent historian, I would encourage you to think about possibly uh, buying uh, Faith Cook's book on Lady Jane Grey. And um, Reformation Heritage Books, uh, which is a publishing house that is linked with Puritan Reform Theological Seminary and Joel Beakey, uh, they have published a series of books on historical figures for children. Um, many years ago, when I first got into publishing, I was involved in a uh, for four years as the editorial director of a publishing house that's still going called Joshua Press. And one of the aims of Joshua Press was to produce solid uh, Christian literature for children. And uh, it's, a, it's a challenging field. And I'm very thankful over the last probably decade to 15 years that there's been a number of publishers that have brought out some very good titles. And Reformation Heritage Books have this fabulous series that are absolutely gorgeously illustrated on various uh, historical figures, ranging from people like uh, Augustine all the way through to Anselm. Uh, interesting to think, you know, writing a book on Anselm for children, uh, all the way through to John Owen, Jonathan Edwards. And there is one there on Lady Jane Grey. And uh, if you know of children who are interested in history or who should be interested in history, which uh, I would argue all children should be interested in history. Uh, eight is maybe nine through 14, 15. Uh, that, that book would be a fabulous uh, choice. Um, I have one uh, prayer request, which also links with a book. Um, one of the big projects, probably the big project that I've been involved in since around the year 2004 is a critical edition of the works of Andrew Fuller. And if you don't name, know the name of Andrew Fuller, you definitely need to know his name. Uh, he is the most important Calvinistic Baptist theologian between the late, oh, the, the, between the 1780s, and although he dies in 1815, his theology is the dominant mode of Calvinistic Baptist theology all the way down really to the time of uh, James Pettigrew Boyce, Spurgeon, uh, Spurgeon wrote a letter to his son uh, around, probably around 1878, in which he told him that he regarded his father as the greatest Baptist theologian of the 19th century. And I think there is enormous proof uh, to support that. But anyway, we've been involved with, at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, an ongoing project to bring out a critical edition of those works. And we have brought out two. There are 16 planned. Uh, they're, not, they're not cheap. <laughs> uh, they're being published by an academic publishing house called Walter de Greuter. Um, it's a long story. It's fraught with providence, providential uh, events that de Greuter took this project on. I remember sitting down with the editorial director, a man named Albrecht Donnert, German, and uh, they published works by people like Paul Tillich, uh, Martin Heidegger, uh, very, very different from Andrew Fuller. And I remember asking him, I said, so what, what, you know, what do you know about Andrew Fuller? Why, why have you taken this project on? And he said to me, he said, the truth of the matter is, uh, I was uh, encouraged to do so by a mutual friend, a Calvinistic brother named Hermann Seldehuis, who is Dutch. And he said, I, frankly, I, I, I know virtually nothing about him. <laughs> and I thought, this is absolutely amazing that here is a first-class academic publishing house that is prepared to sink thousands of dollars into a project of which they hardly know anything. Uh, they've learned over the years that we've been working together. Um, I mentioned that for you to pray about that project. 
Uh, one of the rarities in Baptist life is uh, academic publishing of the works of our worthies. Um, we have some great publishing houses like Banner of Truth, etc. They have tended to publish uh, Presbyterians and Pado Baptists. And one of the arguments I've heard over the years is that, yes, the Calvinistic Baptists uh, uh, certainly maintain the same sort of theology, but when it comes to theological finesse and depth, the Presbyterians always said it better. And I take uh, deep offense at that. And uh, so I'm very encouraged by de Groeter being able to publish these books. There's only one other Baptist that uh, has had such a, an honor, and that's John Bunyan. Oxford University Press published his collected works. And so I encourage you to pray for that project. I'm not necessarily encouraging you, if you will, if you feel so inclined uh, to buy the books. The, the complete set, when it's published, will be somewhere around $3,500, so it's not cheap. But if you know of libraries, one of the things we are trying to do is get standing orders of libraries. This is of great pressing importance because the publishing house has told us that if they don't sell 100, uh, 100 copies per volume, they have the liberty to pull the series. So we need, if you know of libraries, of Baptist schools, Baptist colleges, um, you could maybe send the, the name of maybe the librarian to me, uh, mhaken at sbts.edu, and we'd be more than happy to take it from there. We desperately need uh, uh, libraries to place standing orders for these books. And that brings me to one final kind of uh, plug. Um, I've the, the volume that I've been most recently working on is Andrew Fuller's Memoirs of Samuel Pierce. And uh, it was his most well re re reproduced book in the 19th century. It went through multiple editions on both sides of the Atlantic. If this was a Baptist congregation in the 1880s, 1890s, I wouldn't have to talk anything about Samuel Pierce. You would all know his name. He, was, he is a paragon of Calvinistic Baptist spirituality, a very close friend of William Carey, longed to go to the mission field, dies at the age of 33 from tuberculosis. And Fuller wrote his, his memoir, and there's an unforgettable line that Fuller says when he found out that uh, his friend had died. He said, oh, that the God of Samuel Pierce might be my God. And that's uh, just a remarkable statement. Uh, that, uh, I've been working on that now for about a year. Uh, the final proofs are about to be sent away. And so that book should be available this year. Um, it is, uh, as I say, it'll be expensive. It'll be about $120 to $130. But there is an $8 version <laughs> uh, that is available that uh, it's not a critical edition. Uh, what I did with the critical edition, I went through the first five editions and I compared them and every time they differed, even down to the point of punctuation, I made notes of that in footnotes. So it was a fairly arduous work, but that's the sort of thing you do with critical editions. But there is a Solid Ground Christian Books have reprinted uh, this version, uh, Heart for Missions. And I encourage you strongly, all of you, to purchase a copy of this. Uh, there are some copies downstairs that Brother Michael Gadosh has. Uh, it is just a tremendous, tremendous work of uh, what, 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 what our hearts should beat like for the extension of the kingdom, as, and also a tremendous illustration of what is absolutely vital in the Christian life, that is friendship. Whenever God has done great works in the history of the church, He has done it through a band of brothers and sisters. One of the dangers of the sort of way that I've presented the, uh, my lectures, and uh, I'm aware of this, is one gets the impression that the German Reformation was Martin Luther, and the English Reformation was William Tyndale, and we'll look at Thomas Cramner. But that's a misunderstanding. Around Luther, there was a dozen men, and, well, and his wife, Katharina. Around Calvin, I, there was a book recently published uh, by Calvin, on Calvin called Calvin's Friends by Emmanuel Machiel Vandenberg. 
uh, 30 chapters. Uh, I thought I knew Calvin fairly well. Half of them, I'd never heard of these people. These were men and women who were close to Calvin, who supported him in a variety of ways. And so it is with every time when God does a great work, whether it's through Reformation, Christian literature being published, uh, the renewal of local churches, it is never simply one individual. It is a band of brothers and sisters, and that's very, very important. And uh, Samuel Pierce's life illustrates that so, so vividly. Now, we want to turn to Cramner. You should have in the package of materials you've received a sheet that, and I'll be using this uh, for about uh, 10, 12 minutes in the talk, called Thomas Cramner's Collects and Prayers. And so make sure you have that handy. I also, there will also be a sheet uh, on Lady Jane Grey that will be vital to what we want to talk about when we talk about Jane Grey this afternoon. I'm a Calvinistic Baptist. And I owe great debt, obviously, to those who've come before me in the faith. I've spent um, a large part of my life uh, studying Calvinistic Baptist history in the 18th century particularly. I can still remember the first day I came across the name of Andrew Fuller. I have this very weird habit that if I've sometimes got an hour or two to kill and I'm near a library, I'll go to a library and just walk down the aisles of maybe an area that interests me generally and just pull books off that I don't know and look at them. And I've had some serendipitous discoveries over the years. I can still remember in the library of Toronto Baptist, uh, it was a Central Baptist Seminary in Toronto, uh, third floor of that building, going, walking through the library and coming across three books, uh, the works of Andrew Fuller. I'd never heard of him, pulled off the third volume. I was deeply interested in the work of the Holy Spirit, and the book fell open at an essay on the necessity of the Spirit for the promotion of missions, and I was hooked. That was 1985. As I say then, I'm a Calvinistic Baptist, deeply indebted, obviously, to my forebears. But as Calvinistic Baptists here, we also have a deep debt to Anglicans, the gospel was not first preached in England by Calvinistic Baptists. They come along a bit later in the, in the course of history, but it was Anglicans that our forebears first heard the gospel. William Kiffin, Hansard Knowles, Christopher Blackwood, Thomas Patience, Hercules Collins, Henry Danvers, all of these men first heard the gospel in Anglican churches from Reformed preachers. And at the heart of the Anglican Reformation, the Reformation of the Church of England, is this man, Thomas Cramner. He would be the Archbishop of Canterbury. He lived to, through tumultuous days. He was one of the few men close to the king, Henry VIII, to survive his reign. We're going to ask questions as to why he survived. Uh, we will see that Thomas Cramner is a complex figure. Ken Brownell, an American who has lived as an expatriate in London for the last 30 years, pastor of East London Tabernacle, where Archibald Brown was for many years, who Ian Murray has just written a biography of, of has said of Thomas Cramner, more than any other figure apart from John Knox, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, few men have done more to shape English Protestant spirituality and to drive into the soul of a nation the fundamentals of Protestant Christianity than Thomas Cramner. And we'll see the reason why. And it's a book. But he's a complex figure. Unlike these figures that I've just mentioned, there's a complexity to Cramner because he survives the reign of Henry VIII for a variety of reasons. There are probably three reasons that I'll enunciate. But one of them is compromise. Thomas Brownell, the article from which I've just quoted, actually, the subtitle is Thomas Cramner, colon, compromiser or strategist. And there are elements in his life that give us pause. 
which we'll see. He was one who shared the common Reformation goals that as men like Cranmer and Calvin and Luther looked out across Europe and they looked at what we call Christendom, they did not see a Christian continent. What they saw was a Christianity that was a, uh, an inch thick, even though it covered the entirety of that continent. The Reformers are often accused of having no mission-mindedness. They certainly did have a mission-mindedness, but it was first and foremost to plant the gospel in Europe. When they looked out across Europe, they did not see Christian churches. They saw a mission field that demanded the preaching of the gospel and the replanting of churches. Cramner was born in 1489. His background is fairly modest. His parents were able to scrape enough money together to send him to college, and he goes up to Jesus College in Cambridge in 1503 at the age of 14. Uh, that's pretty normal. Uh, don't, when you hear those sort of stats, you think, man, the guy's okay, he's another one of these geniuses. Uh, the BA in England in the 16th century is more really equivalent to a high school degree, and the MA then would be more like a BA. Uh, Cramner was in his element when he went up to Cambridge. Uh, as one writer, Jeffrey Bromley, has said, to look at Cramner is to look at the face of a scholar. He loved academia. He loved the context of books and learning and lecturing. He would in time become proficient in a variety of languages. Many of the individuals in this period did. Uh, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, Italian. He was deeply versed in the church fathers. One of the things that many of these authors in this period uh, spent time doing was reading the church fathers, particularly Augustine. And uh, they used to great effect the writings of Augustine against Roman Catholic apologists and polemicists, and would argue that the early church figures are actually ours. Again, an area that I've spent a lot of time reading is in the early fathers, and I've had people ask me, you know, how can you read the early fathers and not be a Catholic? And my response is, it's a bit naughty, but my response is, how can, how can, you, read, how can you read the fathers and still be a Catholic? The reality is, there's no Mariolatry, there's no papacy, there's no mass, and all of the things that are essential to Roman Catholicism are later developments. But he becomes, he actually keeps, these have never been published, he keeps what we call commonplace books. He would read the variety, of, he'd read the fathers, and then he would take quotes from them and keep these quotes in large folio volumes. And these have never been published, but they illustrate that Cramner knew his church history as well as the scriptures very, very well. Around the 1520s, he becomes a priest in the Roman church. At the very same time, the Reformation is coming into Cambridge. We talked a little bit about that with Tyndale. Again, we have, like with Tyndale, we have no exact knowledge as to when Cramner embraced Reformation truths, that is, justification by faith alone, and the supremacy of the Bible as the touchstone of all theology and practice. Did he listen to some of the early preachers? It's possible. Did he embrace those doctrines in the 1520s? It's possible. The earliest, really, that we know is around 1533, and let me read a quote from that. I'm jumping on a little here, but around 1533, he could say this in a letter. He's crit critiquing the papacy. The papacy and the see of Rome have suppressed Christ. They have set up the pope as a god of this world, and they have brought the professors of Christ, that is, those who profess to be believers, into an ignorance of Christ. So by the 1530s, he definitely is an evangelical. When that happened, we don't know. In 1529, a very important conversation took place. By this point in time, Cramner is in his 30s. And... Uh, Actually, early 40s. He's around 40. And uh, he's not well known. 
He's a scholar in Cambridge. And uh, he has a dinner which will change his life. It's interesting, as I said yesterday, how events turn on little, little things sometimes. He sits down for dinner with a friend of his, a man named Stephen Gardner. I mentioned him yesterday. He was the Bishop of Winchester who executed John Rogers. It will be Stephen Gardner who will be instrumental in the execution of Cramner many years down the road. The conversation had to do, Stephen Gardner was a bishop in England, the the conversation had to do with a thing called the king's privy, private matter. And that had to do with the king's marriage. And uh, one of the things I think is very important that when we study the history of the past, we do so in what I would describe, I don't think that this term's unique to me, but I think I've picked it up in various places. We do what we call deep history. We recognize that the figures of the past that we're thinking of in church history, the only thing in their lives was not simply theology. Like us, they got up in the morning, they had breakfast, they got dressed, uh, they made their way maybe to work. Uh, They interacted with people in various ways. They had to buy food. They had families. They had to wrestle with various things like that. And really, to do history well, you have to recognize that there are a multitude of influences that shape a person in their culture. And um, uh, it's not unimportant, as you study the English Reformation, to recognize that it's bound up with the larger politics of the day. The king was Henry VIII. He had become the king of England in 1509. He was married to a Spanish Catholic princess named Catherine of Aragon. His father, Henry VII, had married first his older brother, Arthur, to this Spanish princess. It was a political alliance. It was a day in which marriages of the aristocracy were frequently political alliances. England allied herself to Spain because she wanted a bulwark against her great enemy, France. England and France had been at war all through the late Middle Ages. In fact, uh, England and France would be great enemies all the way down to the 19th century. It's interesting to note between 1690 and 1815, the English and the French fought each other every decade except for one. And so England needed a bulwark, and Spain was the great power in Europe, and so the way you did that was you cemented it by a political alliance, and Henry VII, Henry VIII's father, married his older brother, Arthur, to Catherine of Aragon. He was dead within a year. He want, Henry VII wanted to continue the alliance, and so he He wrote to the Pope, Julius II, will you give my son a special dispensation, my second son, Henry, to marry Catherine? And the amount of money was sent, (laughs) and the Pope signed the the declaration. And so Henry was married off to a woman that's about 10 years his senior. They had a daughter, Mary I in 1516. And then they had a long series of miscarriages and stillborn children well into the 1520s. Henry VIII was convinced, his father had drilled it into him, you need to have a son. A woman cannot rule England. If a woman comes to the throne, it'll be anarchy and civil war. In fact, there had been a long civil war in the 1400s called the Wars of the Roses between 1455 and 1487, and that was very much in the minds of everybody. We don't want to go back into civil war. We need a son. Henry as time wears on, doesn't appear that he can have a son. Now, with the advances, obviously, significant advances in gynecology, etc., we know that sometimes it's not always the woman's fault, sometimes the man's fault. Uh, But this is a, a male patriarchal world, and it's always the woman's fault that he can't have a son. And finally, Henry comes up with a biblical verse. It's found in Leviticus, thou shalt not marry thy brother's widow. Uh, a wife, and Henry's got his verse. He writes to the Pope, Clement VII, and says, look, it's obvious my, my marriage is cursed. 
It's under the curse of God. You need to give me an annulment, not a divorce. Roman Catholic Church did not recognize divorce. An annulment, which means that Catherine has been living in an immoral relationship with Henry all these 20 or so years, and that her child, Mary, is an illegitimate child. The Pope would have done it. You send the amount of money, he would have signed that document too. The only, but there was only one big problem. Catherine of Aragon was the aunt of the most powerful man in Europe, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, the man before whom Luther had stood in 1521 at the Diet of Worms. Not Worms, remember. And uh, so... Charles writes to the Pope, he finds out about Henry's plan to annul the marriage, and he says, if you annul that marriage, it'll be the last thing you ever do as Pope. And uh, he knew that Charles was as good as his word, because about two or three years earlier, Charles had marched into Italy with his troops, besieged the Pope in a, in a, in a castle, and forced him to yield to certain demands. And so the Pope's caught between a rock and a hard place, or as some might say, the devil in the deep blue sea, or whatever. And what he does is he, he does what politicians do. He stalls for time and he hopes one of them might die and that'll be the end of his problem. And, but neither of them do die. They're both young men. And by the, by the late 1520s, Henry's in a real tizzy. I've got, I'm, I'm married to a woman who can't give me a son. The marriage is under the curse of God. Who will free me from this woman? And so this momentous dinner takes place between Stephen Gardner and Thomas Cramner. Cramner had no idea what was going to happen going into the dinner. He just meeting with a friend, a fellow a, a bishop. Um, and Stephen says to him, are you aware of the problem the king has? It was known as the king's privy matter, the king's private matter, but everybody, everybody in Europe knew about it. And so as they're discussing and and Cramner comes up with a brilliant idea, at least Gardner thought it was. Why don't you write to all the theological faculties in Europe, there are about 50 or 60 of them, and ask them to have a two-day conference or a one-day conference like this, and uh, they can produce papers on this issue and write a book of the papers. And surely somebody, some theologian in Europe will come up with the idea of how to solve the problem. And the king loved it. The king was thrilled to bits. The theologians in Europe are going to solve my privy matter. And so letters were duly sent out. It, it's bizarre. It, it'd be like, you know, if uh, President Trump had problems with his marriage and he decides to write to all the theological seminaries in America and my president, Dr. Moeller, gets a letter from President Trump. You know, I'm having problems in my marriage, and would you please get all the ethicists and the theologians and the New Testament scholars and the Old Testament scholars, convene, we'll pay for it, convene a conference for two days, write some papers, put them together in a book, and send it to me. And every theological faculty in America got, got, did this. There were about 50 books published. And up until, oh, probably about three years ago, I, I thought this would be a fabulous uh, PhD topics, just to read through them and discuss them. And I, I've mentioned it a number of times in various places. Well, lo and behold, somebody's, somebody's done this. And uh, now what's significant about that? Nobody came up with the idea that Henry eventually adopted. It brought Cramner to the king's attention. The king loved this idea. After a number of years, two or three years later, Finally, Henry came up with the idea that he would adopt. If I was the head of the church in England, not the Pope, I could give myself my own divorce. Brilliant. There was more in involved than the simply marriage, though. There was also the realization that the Roman Catholic Church owned somewhere between a quarter to a third of the land of England and Wales. It's an enormous amount of property. If I, I'm the head of the church, all of that property is now mine. So in 1534, he passed the Act of Supremacy. Uh, he became known as the head of the church. Uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, I'm a Canadian. Uh, I have a queen who is the head of state, but she is also the head of the Anglican Church. And uh, the current Anglican Church is wrestling with the ordination of uh, homosexuals. And that'll probably pass within a year or two, I suspect. And the queen, despite her profession of faith, uh, she's going to be forced probably to pass that into law. If she, does, it'll, if she doesn't, it'll be a crisis. It'll be a constitutional crisis. And I'm not sure how the Anglican Church would react to that. But I'm not an Anglican, so it's not my problem. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a, a fascinating period of time. Why did Henry embrace the Reformation? Was it because he accepted justification by faith? Absolutely not. He did abandon some Catholic doctrines. He no longer believed in purgatory. He obviously no longer believed in the supremacy of Peter. But he didn't become a real reformer. But he's part of the Reformation. It's a messy affair. And this is true of church history. One of the dangers, and somebody had criticized me years ago, and there is an element of truth in this. He said, Michael, you know, when you, when you teach church history, it's, it's romanticized. <laughs> and I, 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 I confess to having a romantic bent uh, and, uh, it's, and so on. But the reality is church history is messy. Church life is messy. And uh, we, pray for, we pray for revival. I hope you pray for revival. But when, if we had a revival like the extent of the first and second great awakenings, there'd be some messes. It's not, it's not, it's not, this side of the kingdom, uh, there are challenges living in this world, even in the best of times. And so the Reformation was messy in England. You have, on the one hand, you've got Tyndale pressing through with his Bible, pressing through the Reformation. On the other, you've got the king now embracing the Reformation but it's for political reasons. It's for marital reasons. This has massive effect down the road. As I said, the queen is still the head of the Church of England. The union of church and state still goes on to a large extent in England. I remember a number of years ago sharing the gospel to one of my Irish uncles. I had the quintessential Irish name, Paddy, Paddy O'Gorman. And uh, I remember his, I'll never forget his response. He said, hey, you know what, you know what your, your, your Reformation was all about? It was all about that king and his women. And uh, that, this has a, lo a long, long, long-term impact. And so Henry, Henry then grants, his, grants his, himself his own divorce. Cramner is involved in the divorce of Henry and Catherine of Aragon. His daughter, Mary I, Catherine and Henry's daughter, will never forgive him and never forget. He then marries one of her ladies in waiting, Anne Boleyn. The more I've studied Anne Boleyn, the more remarkable I think she was as a queen. She had entered into intimate relations with the king prior to their marriage, was pregnant, therefore, when she married him. But as time went on over the next two or three years, she began to listen to the gospel. It is Anne Boleyn who compels Henry, you need to allow the Bible to be placed in every parish church. There needs to be the scriptures in English. She urged him to read early reformers. She placed in his hands books written by reformers on the continent, by Luther and so on. And uh, she has her first child. It's a girl. Elizabeth I. Well, Henry's young, she's young, surely he'll have a son. He has a second pregnancy, a stillborn son. Henry's response is furious. There's got to be a problem with this. It's not me, it must be her. And on trumped up charges of adultery, he has her arrested, tried, and executed. And her, her faith sustains her in her prison. And it's very clear that she dies as an evangelical. Cramner did something which endangered his life. He came before the king, kneeling and pled with him, do not do this. Do not go through with this and execute your, your, your second wife. He refused to listen to him. 
He then married Jane Seymour. The Seymours were a very powerful family in England. Edward Seymour, her brother, was regularly writing to John Calvin. And Jane Seymour, the queen, uh, is an evangelical. You might, you might be thinking, how can an evangelical marry such a man? Well, you had a choice. <laughs> uh, Henry was the sort of guy, you marry me or I'll take your head off. I mean, he was a, br he was a kind of early modern Saddam Hussein is the reality. And so Jane Seymour marries him and uh, bears a child and finally a son, Edward VI. And Henry is ecstatic. She dies of septicemia two weeks after giving birth. Uh, if you ever go to the Westminster Abbey and where the kings and queens of England are buried, uh, Henry is buried in the tomb with Jane Seymour. He will claim she's the only woman he ever really loved. Of course, time, <laughs> who knows what might have happened over time. He then marries a fourth wife that was arranged by a man named Thomas Cromwell, a very important figure in this period of time. Cromwell had, had been given a significant amount of land that Henry had seized from the Roman Catholic Church and had great power. He too was in support of the Reformation, and I think genuinely so. He's not to be confused with Oliver Cromwell. Please do not make that confusion. Cromwell comes later and is a distant relative. Thomas Cromwell said to Henry, I've got this great match, a German Lutheran named Anne of Cleves. He showed her, Henry a picture of her, stunning. Henry was, the picture was sent over of Henry. The picture was about 25 years younger when Henry was just a remarkable specimen of manhood. Uh, he was quite a remarkable looking figure in his early years, well over six feet tall, bu big bushy red beard, huge shock of red hair, uh, a kind of a remarkable horseman, fabulous at jousting, a skilled musician, composed his own music and songs, gifted in languages and theology, quite, quite a remarkable figure. When they met each other, the reality was horrifying. Uh, and Henry was furious at this, and he chopped off Thomas Cromwell's head. Poor Cromwell had never actually seen the woman. All he'd seen was a picture. And uh, so that's the fourth marriage. Henry now marries, this is all very important. You might be thinking, man, this is, I didn't come to listen to a long string of uh, Henry VIII, but Henry now marries Catherine Howard. She's 18. She's old enough to be his granddaughter. She is a diehard Catholic. Her family, the Howards, are the Duke, of, the Duke and Duchess of Norfolk. The, Duke, the current Duke of Norfolk is still a Catholic. It's an amazing thing. It's the one aristocratic family in England that's been able to pass down Roman Catholicism uh, ever since this period of time. Suddenly now, Catholicism is back in vogue. Justification by faith is condemned. The Reformation takes a, a back seat in England. Cramner has married by this time. He's in a real problem because bi priests and bishops need to be celibate. He hides his wife in England for a period of time and then ships her off to the continent. He compromises to save his skin. In the providence of God, and God's providence governs all things, right? Catherine Howard is caught in adultery. Henry finds out. He chopped her head off and then marries Catherine Parr, a remarkable evangelical woman who raises Elizabeth I. And although Elizabeth I has got problems with Puritans, she is a Calvinist. Very interesting. She's a Calvinist but doesn't like the Puritans. And the, because the Puritans told her... Madam, remember one day you must give an account to an immortal God, and you're a mortal creature. And the, 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 the governance of the church has not been placed into your hands, but into the hands of the elders. And she didn't like that. But she learned her faith at the hands, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Catherine Parr with Jane Grey. She learned her faith at the hands of Catherine Parr, and Catherine Parr will outlast Henry and Henry dies in 1547. When I was growing up in England, we had a little jingle, how to remember what happened to all the wives. So you got six. Divorced, beheaded, died, 
divorced, beheaded, survived. <laughs> uh, if you want to remember what happened to all the, the six. Deeply involved in the politics of the day. Cramner survives. He is one of the very few men around Henry who survives. Why does he survive? In one sense, he's a compromiser. He compromises. In another sense, though, Henry knew that this man did not want power. He has no interest in power. What he has is a genuine interest in the gospel going forward in England. When Edward becomes king, he's 10 years old. Over the next six years, the Reformation is, becomes warp, part of the warp and woof of the soul of the English people. The parish church is completely revised in terms of its worship. Henry uh, Thomas Cramner plays a major role in that. He draws up a thing called the Book of Common Prayer, published in, first in 1549 and then the revised edition in 1552. And I would encourage you strongly to get a copy of that 1552, or as it's more commonly known today, 1662 Book of Common Prayer. There'll be some things in there you disagree with. You obviously disagree with probably, like I do, with the whole area of bishops. You disagree with infant baptism. But the prayers in that book are rich, rich examples of theology. Why am I encouraging you, as part of a tradition where extemporaneous prayer has been our, our, our kind of lodestar, to read written prayers? Because of the danger which accompanies all faithful praying, we get into ruts. You, you, you listen to your prayers day after day, and you'll find you, you go down the same path frequently. It used to be, I, me I remember seeing this very early on in my Christian life. I was converted at Stanley Avenue Baptist Church in Hamilton, Ontario. And at prayer meetings, there was a brother who would stand up, and everybody knew it was this brother. You didn't have to open your eyes to see him, because he always began his prayers in the identical way. Lord, we are here in this here part of your vineyard. And he had two or three phrases that always began his prayers. He never began any other way. Or more recently, I was at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London with the pastor, is Peter Masters. Remarkable ministry. Dr. Masters has a very unique way of praying. I'm at the prayer meeting. I've only ever been to one prayer meeting there, midweek prayer meeting. And there were about 20 people prayed that night. To me, I'm sure they didn't think this, they all sounded like him. I'd heard him pray a number of times in service. I could have picked him out from any crowd. He's got a very unique way of praying. It's rich, it's biblical, but it's Peter Masters. They all sounded like little clones of Peter Masters. I'm sure they wouldn't have thought that. And I think it's very helpful in our private devotions whether, what, whether we ever use written prayers publicly, that we use prayers written to help us break out of our ruts. And there are a number of things. The Valley of Vision, I don't know how many of you, it's their, their Banner of Truth best-selling book in North America. It's a collection of prayers. And uh, this was a big debate, by the way, among the Puritans, whether or not to use written prayers. There were some Puritans, like Calvin, who believed in the use of written prayers. Others, like John Bunyan, John Owen, didn't at all. I think, and I fall on that first side, I think they are helpful. Whether or not we, we use them in public worship, they are helpful in personal devotion. Let me show you some of Cramner's prayers. One of the critical areas that I mentioned earlier was the reformation of worship. Cramner realized it is not sufficient to reform doctrine. Our doctrine has to lead to reformation of worship. Theology must lead to doxology. So, let's take a look at that, that handout I gave you. And uh, I've given you there four collects and then a prayer from the Lord's table. A collect is um, a, a little prayer. The, the Anglicans obviously follow the church calendar, beginning, which begins with Advent, then you get Christmas, Epiphany, and then Lent, Easter, Pentecost, Trinity Sunday. 
And there would be a prayer that would be prayed at all the services during that week, or evening and morning prayer, and then the Sunday services. Cramner, there were about 70 colleagues in the Book of Common Prayer, 1552. Cramner wrote 25 of them. Some of them, this is amazing. This is why I think this is rich too. Some of these prayers go all the way back to the 3rd and 4th century. Cramner, I, 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 I should show you what some of these colleagues had looked like before the Reformation. There'd be prayers to the saints, prayer to Mary. Cramner completely cleansed these prayers of all of that. But look at, look at these prayers. First of all, the, one, the second Sunday in Advent. Blessed Lord, which has caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. In a collect, there normally is an address to God. He's then described, and this, here the attribute of God is, He has given us the Holy Scriptures for our learning. And then the prayer. Grant that we may hear the Word. Cramner expected God's people to regularly come to hear the Word of God preached. Not only hear them, but read them. In your, Cramner wanted the people of God to have the Scriptures in their own home and read them. To mark and learn them. To study them. But please note, that's not the, the final goal. The goal is that you might memorize the Word and inwardly digest it. One of the areas, I think, in which we as evangelicals have failed is that we have failed to emphasize the vital necessity of the memorization of Scripture. We do it with children. We don't do it with adults. That we might meditate on the Word of God. One of the great... This, this, this little collect, it can be shown, produces a body of people we call the Puritans who specialized in meditation on the Word of God. And it's a lost art. And then the goal of this is that by doing these things, ultimately, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Or the collect for Trinity Sunday. One of the great things about the Christian faith is that we deal in great truths. Let no one ever say that it's people who don't think who've embraced Christianity. Christianity is not a faith for dummies. I'm going to say something, and I don't want to be misunderstood. If you want a faith for dummies, become a Muslim. It's easy. Five things you've got to do. There's only one God. You don't have to worry about the incarnation. You don't have to worry about the Trinity. I say, I say that... <laughs> guardedly and with a degree of reverence, I hope. And I'm not trying to put Muslims down personally. It's just a very, very simple. Christianity is not a simple faith. On one sense, it is simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It is simple enough for a little sheep to go down to a river and drink. But it is deep enough for an elephant to get into that same river and never touch bottom. It shouldn't surprise us that Christianity is a, is a faith with deep, deep truths that try the mind. And some of the greatest minds in the history of the church have spent their lives seeking to plumb the depths and never touching bottom, from Augustine all the way down to men like Carl Henry. And one of the great truths, the greatest truth in some respects of our faith, is the Trinity. Look at this. Collect for Trinity Sunday, Almighty and everlasting God, which has given unto us thy servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. We beseech thee that through the steadfastness of this faith we may evermore be defended from all adversity which livest and reignest one God world without end. Notice how he ties together the confession of the Trinity with staying in the faith. 
This past summer, there was a big brouhaha about the doctrine of the Trinity. You may have seen some of it on the web. I think uh, some of that was because we as evangelicals in the 20th century have failed to preach and teach the Trinity. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I've done this in classes at Southern. How many in this church who are pastors have preached the Sermon on the Trinity in the last 10 years, 20 years? How many sermons have you ever preached on the Trinity? How many sermons have you heard on the Trinity? And why not? I remember doing it in a class of about 150 students. How many here have heard a sermon on the Trinity in the last 10 years? I think I had two or three. Two or three Christians at Southern, a, a great seminary, who raised their hands, who could say that they'd heard a sermon on the Trinity. And what's the matter with us? And here is, here is the, I think, the richest part of our faith. If God is not a triune God, we are still in our sins. This is the reality. The Trinity, this is not simply some sort of arcane doctrine that only theologians have to think about. It goes to the very heart of our faith. As B.B. Warfield said, the entirety of the New Testament is filled with the confession of the Trinity. All the way from the baptismal formula of Matthew 28, all the way to statements like the little appearance of the word His, when Jesus talks about when the Son of Man returns, He will send out His angels. Who is this man who owns angels? Or, this is from the communion service in the Book of Common Prayer. This and one fell swoop undermines the entire Roman Catholic system of sacramentalism and of all the sacraments and the good works. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, which of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation, that is sacrifice, of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that, his precious death, until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we beseech thee. That is a tremendous statement that in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a full, complete sacrifice for our sins. On the assurance of that, we can go into the presence of a holy God, confident that He hears us, despite what the accuser might say. It's a tremendous, tremendous theological statement packed into prayer. And there is, I think there is just cause for reading these sort of prayers to shape our own praying. If you think this is unbiblical, uh, let me ask you the question, and you need to give the answer to this. Why has God given us in Holy Scripture so many prayers? The whole book of Psalms, all the prayers of Paul in the New Testament. Why doesn't Paul simply say, I'm praying for you? But he actually lit, he actually goes through uh, exactly how he's praying. Why is that there? It is that we might imitate the Apostle Paul, that we might learn how to pray like that. And so I, I would urge and argue that the use of written prayers like this is very helpful for us spiritually. There was a massive then reformation that takes place. Six years, God gives a window in which parish church worship was reformed. Edward, though, was a sickly child. He dies in 1553. He had had measles, didn't take care of himself, and measles uh, weakened his constitution, and he contracted tuberculosis and died in the early months of 1553. As he's dying, he is well aware, by the way, of who he, of what God has given him. Uh, Calvin wrote him a fabulous letter in which he said to him, you are like a young Josiah. And he gave him advice on how to reform the nation. In his last two or three years, Edward wrote around a hundred essays. It's about 14, uh, 15-year-old boy wrote about 100 essays, 50 in Latin, 
50 in English. It's quite clear this young man embraced the entirety of what we call the Reformation, Reformation truth, and wanted to see the English people schooled and taught in it. He knew that it, when he died, his father's will designated Mary as his heir. And she was a diehard Catholic. And then the second, if Mary died without issue, then Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was regarded as illegitimate, and then a young woman named Lady Jane Grey. We'll talk about her this afternoon. And so on his deathbed, and up until probably the last 25, 30 years, it, it was often thought those around Edward manipulated him, but it's very evident now, Dermot McCulloch, a, 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 an excellent historian of the 16th century, not a Christian, but an excellent historian of the 16th century has shown definitively that Edward himself knew what he was doing and he changed his father's will and made Lady Jane Grey his heir. And Cramner put his approval to it. We'll see this afternoon how Mary was not going to allow that to happen. She marches on London, seizes power, and is determined to destroy what Edward had done. She arrests all of the key leaders. She allows Edward to have a Protestant funeral. Cramner uh, conducts that funeral. And then Cramner is imprisoned. Ridley, uh, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, John Hooper. And she begins to put them on trial and burn them one by one. John Hooper dies in Gloucester. Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer are burned in Oxford. You can still go to Oxford and see the very spot that they gave their lives. It's, it's a cobble street road that leads to a great bookstore called Blackwell's. If you've ever been to, uh, if you're into books like I am, Blackwell's is a dangerous place. Three floors, the one whole floor is just him, simply history and theology. It's just a very dangerous place. I've spent a lot more money in that bookstore I care to think of. Uh, but on the way there, I never, I never stopped to look. There is a thing called the Martyr's Memorial, uh, which is around the corner, but that's not the place. It's, uh, this little, it's a little cross in these cobblestones, and there's a sign on the wall opposite it called St. John's College, and it says, on this spot in the fall of 1555, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer gave their lives for their Protestant faith. There was a prison next to it. Thomas Cramner was in the prison. He was brought up to the top of the prison to watch his close friends burn Latimer burned quickly. The wood around him was seasoned. The wood around Ridley was green. At one point, Ridley cried out, I cannot burn. And Latimer said these famous words. Master Ridley, play the man, for this day we shall light a candle that shall not be put out in England. What Mary did was she brought Priests from Spain, she was actually married to the, she had married King Philip of Spain II. She brought priests from Spain to install the Spanish Inquisition. England had never seen anything like this. During her reign, she burned around 300 Protestant evangelicals. All of the key leaders she could get hold of, uh, one or two were able to escape, well, actually, a, a handful, men like John Knox. And once she had burned them, she was burning everybody. One of the most horrifying is a woman she arrested, a housewife. Her neighbors told the authorities she's, a, she's an evangelical Protestant. They brought her out. Her friends pled with the authorities, please do not burn. She has a young baby. The authorities went in, found the baby, and threw her into the fire with the mother. And Mary thought, wipe out these evangelicals, and England will willingly follow me back to Rome. What she did was she deepened into the soul of the English people and proved the truth of that adage from the early church that the blood of the martyrs is seed, the seed of the church. It doesn't always act that way, but it frequently, frequently does, that God allows suffering and persecution that his kingdom might go forward. It has been granted unto us not only to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but to suffer for his sake. Cramner, Mary had a problem with him. She hated him because he had been involved in the divorce of her mother. But he, he was an archbishop, duly consecrated by a Roman Catholic bishop. 
that went all the way back to the Pope. So she had to get, she had to get permission from the Pope. That took about a year or so. Meanwhile, Cranmer languished in prison. Sometimes he was tortured. Sometimes they allowed him liberty to go out and walk in gardens. And these people knew what they were doing. They were breaking him psychologically. It's very interesting. Since the 1960s, uh, scholarly opinion on, on how to understand Cranmer has changed. Up until the 1960s, a lot of scholars thought he was a weak man, vacillating, a compromiser, and that's the whole story about the man. But ever since we saw, and I'm sure some of you remember, I was a young child at the time, American pilots who had been downed over North Vietnam coming on television, condemning American imperialism of all of the rhetoric of the communists. We've learned about a thing called brainwashing, where interrogators and torturers can break a person. And that's what happens to Cramner. He was broken. He signed a document, and let me read it. He actually signed six of these, and uh, this one was particularly damning. He signed this privately. I, I, Thomas Cramner, anathematize every heresy of Luther. I confess and believe most surely in one holy Catholic visible church, outside of which there's no salvation. I recognize as its supreme head on earth the Bishop of Rome, whom I admit to be Pope, Vicar of Christ, to whom all the faithful are bound subject. I believe in and worship in the sacrament of the Eucharist, the true body and blood of Christ, most truly without recourse to any type or figure of speech contained under the species of bread and wine, the bread being changed and transubstantiated by divine power in the Roman, into the Redeemer's body and the wine into his blood. I believe in the other six sacraments, and I hold all that the Roman church holds and declares. He signed that. And as I said, up until the 1960s, people thought, man, it's a Judas, or rather, a, 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 almost a Judas-type kind of figure, or at the least a, a Peter. But it's quite evident now that he was brainwashed and broken psychologically. The problem was, it was these are private declarations, and so Henry, uh, uh, Mary arranged that there would be a public show trial. You can still go to the church at St. Mary the Virgin, very famous church. It's down in the main quad in, in Oxford near the Bodleian Library. It's where John Wesley, 200 years later, would preach a sermon to the, the, the university officials, you must be born again. And their response to the sermon would be, never let that man preach in any church in Oxford again. This is where C.S. Lewis preached his great sermon, if you've never read it, the weight of glory. It's the same church. Cramner was brought in. He's in his 70s, bedraggled, a year in, uh, two years in prison, broken, chained to a pole, and he had to listen for an hour for a man preaching against him who laid the blame for the entirety of what England had gone through in the Reformation on his shoulders. And then he was to make his confession, which he had written out beforehand, in which he would declare his allegiance to Rome, and then they were still going to burn him. He begins by saying to this, those listening that they ought to obey their king and queen. Um, Romans 13, that he believed every line of Holy Scripture. Well, Catholics could say that. And then he comes to this part, and he, he had worded it well enough that he was able to get away with a sufficient amount, as we will see. And now for so much as I am come to the end of my life, upon which hangeth all my life past and my life to come, either to live with my master Christ forever enjoyed, or else to be in pain forever with wicked devils in hell. And I see before mine eyes presently either heaven ready to receive me or hell ready to swallow me up. I shall therefore declare to you my very faith, what I believe without any, any dissimulation, for now is no time to dissemble. He said he believed in every article of the Catholic faith, that is the universal faith, 
And then he said this, Now I come to the great thing which so troubleth my conscience more than anything I ever did or said in my whole life, and that is the setting abroad of writings contrary to the truth, which now I hear renounce and refuse. He's renouncing all the things he had signed before. I wrote them, he said, for fear of death, to save my life it might be. And for as much as my hand, he put up his right hand, offended, writing contrary to my heart, my hand shall first be punished, therefore, for may, when I come to the fire, it shall first be burned. As for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist of all his false doctrine. And he didn't get any further. And the Spanish Dominican priests who were there grabbed him, pulled him down, said, you, you, you confess differently from this. And he began to weep. He said, I have never dissembled before. And I want to die as a lover of truth. They let go of him briefly, and he ran. He ran out of the church. You can walk from St. Mary the Virgin to where he died in about two or three minutes. He ran to the stake. And as they lit the fire, a Roman Catholic observer said, I watched him put his right hand right into the fire until it was burned right down to the bone. Not long before his death, he had written a collect, the collect for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. It's on the sheet there. God, which knowest us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers, that for man's frailness we cannot always stand uprightly, grant us to, he- to us the health of body and soul, that all those things which we suffer for sin, by thy help we may well pass and overcome through Christ our Lord. What, what I like about Cramner is he's human. <clears throat> he's like, unless you're odd, He didn't have a taste to die as a martyr. There might be some in the history of the church who want to be martyrs, but I think most of us don't want to die violent deaths like this. He shows us our humanity. He shows us how in the midst of a world that hates the Lord Jesus and his gospel, we sometimes stumble and fall. But Christ keeps his own. And grace will triumph at the end. And Thomas Cramner speaks to us of, yes, our humanity, but of God's grace shining through. And of a man who demonstrated to the end, ultimately, his love for the Lord Jesus and the gospel. We have no idea. We have absolutely no idea what we face I've sometimes heard people pray, you know, Lord, send us a good dose of persecution, <laughs> kind of strengthen us. Anybody prays that has no idea what you're, you have no idea what you're talking about. We have enjoyed tremendous blessings because of the gospel in this continent and in this country. But I suspect those days are coming to a close. I long for, I pray for revival. If God does not grant it, I suspect we face difficult times ahead. I look at my children and I wonder what world would they have to face. We study the lives of such men like this, not to glorify them, but to glorify the God who gave such great grace and pray that it might be ours, that we might stand firm in such a day, days that try the soul, that we might stand firm for Christ and his glory and the gospel. And to recognize this truth, that there is something more important than the most important thing we have, our lives, but there's something more important, the Lord Jesus and his grace. May God give us such grace in our day. Amen.